A few weeks back, Kendra and I decided to take the Whole30 challenge. Essentially, for 30 days, you eat nothing but meat, vegetables, and fruit. Uh, Accountant Mike actually was the one who first told us about it back a couple episodes ago, and we got a little head start. We started the middle of December instead of January 1st, when maybe some of you are deciding to make your changes. And eating nothing but whole foods, getting away from sugar and alcohol, uh, it has me feeling really good. It has me sleeping good at night, and I've noticed that I'm more energized than I was. Maybe you're excited too for this new year. Maybe you have uh, a New Year's resolution, something that you want to do differently in 2017. A lot of people do, and most of them are pretty predictable. This one article I was reading talked about uh, the data that was pulled from Google uh, showed what the most popular New Year's resolutions were. I'm going to give you a second to guess. What do you think number one resolution is? You got it? Get healthy. Yep, me and Kendra have jumped right on the bandwagon. 62 million searches in Google. Next one, get organized. Number three, live life to the fullest. Yo, low. Number four, learn new hobbies. And number five, spend less and save more. So out of the top five things people want to do, spending less, saving more money is a, is a very popular one for New Year's resolutions. Why is that? Well, essentially, to have the life that we want to live, to live life to the fullest, a lot of us can't do that yet because either we're in debt or we're not where we need to be financially to live life to the fullest. And so to get there, one of the steps we need to take is we need to be financially secure. If you're not yet homesteading, and you want to be, or you want to grow your homestead, maybe a farm or a farm business, that's going to require money. In fact, that's one of the biggest things that is holding you back. The listeners, I get emails all the time. I get messages that people are telling me they're so excited to get started, uh, but they have to save up for the land. They have to save up to buy the property. They have to get out of debt first. And so I thought for 2017, for all you homestead dreamers out there who maybe have said this is going to be the year that we're going to do it, we're going to get started, the best way that we could help is to help move one of those roadblocks. In 2016, we had a couple different episodes that were very inspirational about getting started and just doing whatever you could, finding a way to begin. But if you're being held back financially and you couldn't do it, well, this episode is for you. The world that we live in is a crazy place, but you and me, we can each make it a little better. We can live a more sustainable life. We can become more self-sufficient. We can get more connected with the planet around us. And we can do all of this together. So everybody, cozy up. It's time for another episode of Homestead. I currently am um, a money manager. I have my own investment firm that... This is John Paglano. He's the host of the Wealth Steading podcast, and he also has his own company, Investable Wealth LLC. Specialized in working with a select group of clients that want to grow their wealth, uh, primarily through trading stocks. And, and I bring all this up because um, that's not at all where I start. John's select group of clients start with investment portfolios of $250,000. So if you're someone who has an extra $250,000 to invest, but you're not sure what to do with it, you go to John. I figure John could give us homesteaders some great advice because I'm guessing that most of us don't have an extra $250,000. If we do, we certainly could already have bought a beautiful homestead. Not only does John give good advice on money, he also is prepper-minded and homestead-focused. And he's this way because of what happened to him as a young boy. I grew up in western Pennsylvania outside of Pittsburgh. Uh, My family family was mostly blue-collar workers, coal miners, railroaders, uh, people that worked in the the mills and construction. Uh, I had a pretty normal 
middle class lifestyle other than the fact that uh, my father passed away when I was six months old. And my father uh, passed away unexpectedly. He was getting up to go to work one day, tying his work boots, and he had an aneurysm and died. I mean, it was, it was just that quick. My mother was a widow at like 30. She never uh. remarried. She raised my brother and I. My brother was four years older than me. And uh, so he has some memories of my dad. I know I don't. I have no memory at all. You know, my although John my has no memories of his father, he did learn a very important lesson from him. But in any case, my so my dad was in a very poor family. He was a, he was a seventh of uh, of eight kids. So my dad grew up between the the railroad tracks and the slag dump. Basically, all the waste products that came out of the steel mill, they dumped that in a big dump that was behind where my dad grew up. So it was literally, you know, they talk about being on the wrong side of the tracks. I mean, that's what it was. It was, you know, to the one side of his house was a, a, a railroad track connection station, and right behind it was a big old dump. He started working, I don't know, as 10, 11 years old in this in that slag dump, picking up pieces of ore, uh, you know, iron ore and separating bricks and things. It was basically a recycling operation is what we would call it today. So he started literally doing that just from, from working on the dump. Uh, by hand, and then he, you know, he, he his aspiration. I, I saw his his, uh, his high school graduation book, and his uh, his aspiration was to be a, a crane operator. That's what he wanted to be. So picture this 11-year-old boy going out into a dump each day and searching for any kind of metal that he could bring back and get a little money for. That's the way he started working. And by the time he graduated high school, the best life he could imagine for himself was to be a crane operator. You know, he worked his way up from just picking up junk in the, in the slag to, to operating the bulldozers and the cranes and things like that. Then he got to the point where he became a, a key person in that company where he would go out and estimate jobs. And again, it was, it was what we would call recycling today. They went around, tore down old steel mills, coke ovens, things like that, that separate the parts and sell the scrap. And so by the time he was 30, he, uh, he had a house paid for in the suburbs. Uh, so he had moved out of that little you know, dumpy shack that he grew up in. He had a three bedroom brick house. Uh, he owned a 1954 Cadillac. All that was bought and paid. All that was bought and paid for with cash, no debt. Uh, so when he passed away, he left my mother with a home, with a car, with no debt, and then with a small life insurance policy. You know, but that's where my dad's wealth started. So you know, my message to people is, you know, again, it doesn't matter where you start. You can find, uh, you know, uh, the old. Uh, Acre of diamond story, you know, you can find acres of diamonds no matter where you're at. My dad, my dad found them in a slag dump. John's dad learned a very fundamental principle to building a business. He learned how to find value. From the most basic kind, digging through a dump for metal, to the point where he was so good he was being brought to the higher levels of the company that he worked for, right up till he passed away. John may have had a much easier life growing up if his dad had not passed away, but with the breadwinner gone, his family had to live off what was left. Looking back on it now that I'm a you know I'm a parent and I know how much it costs to raise a family, we were we were probably very poor, but I didn't know it at the time. Again, because we had a house, our house was paid for. We had our our old Cadillac. We drove around in again, like until you know, till the the 70s. So um, I didn't realize how little money we probably actually had. But uh, my mother was very frugal, and you know, where other people would have spent it, she didn't. She that that 1954 Cadillac we drove till the 70s. You know, we we never got rid of that car. By the time John graduated high school. There was no wealth to pass on to him. He started where most of us start, which was at zero, graduating and trying to figure out what he was going to do with his life. And as John puts it, he was a bit of a slow starter. You know, I've gone through a lot of twists and turns through the years, and I didn't start my own company until I was you know, even in my 50s. So in a lot of ways, I was a slow starter, but at the same time, I was constantly improving myself, building my wealth. And that's really, the, I think, the message I'd like to share with your audience and that I, I try and share with everybody is that it doesn't matter where you're starting from as long as you start at that point and move and advance from there. 
In today's episode, John is going to share with us seven lessons to building wealth, and we've already learned our first lesson from John. It doesn't matter where you start. Here it is January 1st, and maybe you feel like financially you're in a slag dump. You owe money on a car. Maybe you have some credit card debt that you're carrying. Your savings account, maybe it's at zero. And you think, I'm never going to be able to buy a farm. I'm never going to be able to do this. Well, if you start now, you will be able to. Slowly but surely, you can get out of that slag dump, just like John's dad did. Now it's time for lesson number two, identifying what wealth actually is. So to me, wealth means freedom. And that's one of the reasons I started my podcast was because that was a message that I wanted to get out. And I didn't hear other people in the financial industry talking about wealth that way. They always talk about wealth in terms of money or net worth or things like that. And my perception of wealth, wealth is just an extension of your life, right? You go to work to make money. So you're, you know, you're trading your time for money. And the reason you build wealth is so that you have more control over your time. So when you have assets in the bank or stocks or whatever it is that you have that, that's, that forms your net worth, really what that is, is that's your time in reserve. That's time that you can now choose to spend in ways that you want to, right? Doing good for people, living out your dreams, having hobbies, whatever it is you want to do. So if you picture a life where you're with your family more, on your homestead, working with animals, growing plants, and you're not there yet, but that's your goal. John's saying that wealth is the freedom to be able to do that. So that means that money does not necessarily equal wealth. And this is a very important point to understand. If you go out and get a job right now where you work every day of the week and you work lots of overtime, you could make a lot of money. But if you're a slave to that job for your whole life, to the point where you wind up never being able to make your homestead happen, you don't get to spend any time with your family there, well, you're not really wealthy. You just have a lot of money. Understanding that there's a difference makes a huge difference in your life. The goal is not to be rich in money. It's not to have a big pile of coins to swim through like Scrooge McDuck. It's to be able to enjoy your life, your hobbies, your passions with those you love without it being an irresponsible decision for your family. So to me, wealth is freedom. It's having the ability to choose what you do with your time. It's not money in the bank. You know, it's really your life that's in the bank and you get to choose how to live it. Now that we understand what wealth is, it's time for lesson three. But before John shares that lesson with us, we have to learn a little bit more about his background. I was a poor student, didn't like school at all. I didn't apply myself. And um, so I found myself at, as a teenager saying, well, I can maybe go to a community college or I can go into the, to the, the coal mines or the steel mills. I just looked at the opportunities I had and I said, well, I'm going to go in the military. I, I'll go in the Navy. They have good schools. Um, I, can, I can get an education that way. As it turns out, and this kind of shows you what a dumb, young, naive kid I was, I didn't join the Navy because I hated their uniforms. <laughs> I, went, <laughs> I went down, I talked to the Navy recruiter. I said, man, I don't want to wear those uniforms. And He couldn't take the uniforms. Instead, he decided to join the Marine Corps. Uh, close to a year on an aircraft carrier, working on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier. It was most like being a glorified gas station attendant, clean the windows and the planes, things like that. But John enjoyed it. He got to travel. They sent me to schools learning mechanics. I learned uh, to be a hydraulics. I was qualified as a hydraulics mechanic. Um, After his time in the Marine Corps, he came home and he went to Penn State. Came out of the Marines, came back home, uh, went, to, went to Penn State and uh, studied environmental science and engineering. Eventually, John found himself in his first corporate job. I was probably like 30 years old. I went to work for mobile. I was on the mobile chemical side. And from that point on, I spent the next 20 years 
in corporate America as an industrial sales guy. So John's made it, right? He went to college, he got a corporate job. This is how you do it, right? This is how you build wealth? Well, lesson three, don't believe the brainwashing. Uh, th and this was a real uh, eye-opener for me. This is the epiphany of my life, I guess. The aha moment came for me when I was probably about your age. I was 35. And so instinctually, I knew that building wealth was done through having a business because, again, I saw that in my, in my neighborhood. I saw uh, people that didn't necessarily have an education or didn't appear to have that important of a job they were still wealthy and wealthy in terms of they had everything that the that the doctor or the dentist had i mean they had, they had a nice house they had nice cars and yet they didn't have the formal education but th that was because they they had a business so i i kind of knew that in the back of my head but i think through schooling and then specifically through my mother i was definitely brainwashed into believing that the way to do it was to um, have a white collar job, you know, go to college, get the white collar job, work for a company, uh, you know, have corporate benefits. My mother definitely pushed me in that direction. She was, um, you, know, you know, again, the widow at age 30, the woman that had to struggle all of her life. She wanted her, her kid, I think, to have a good, you know, go get a nice manager, managerial white collar job, wear a suit to work. Um, that seemed like the risk free option for her. And so I know that she definitely wanted to steer me that way. That was the way I was kind of raised. But in the back of my mind, I really, I really saw it as being the, the, the entrepreneur, regardless of whether he's a professional or not. That's the guy that could create the wealth. John pointed out the source of this myth, this myth that to be successful in life, you have to go to college and you have to get a corporate job and you have to rise through the management positions in that job. For John, the origin of that myth started with schooling, and his mom. I can totally attest to this. I remember going through high school. I remember the pressure to go to college. I was a smart kid. I got good grades. I applied myself. But I didn't want to go to college. And I remember the pressure. Counselors telling you that this was the right thing to do. This was the way to be successful. John did it. He listened to his mom. He listened to public schools. And he wound up in that place. But looking around, he didn't see wealthy people. He saw people who were stuck. Saw a lot of miserable people in corporate America, people that didn't like their jobs, people that were, you know, they had the big house on the golf course and they, they made a lot of money, but they didn't have a lot of wealth because they were still living paycheck to paycheck. They had to, you know, finance private school for their kids and the, the big sports car and the boat. And they had all these things that they were just trying to keep up with the Joneses and yet they weren't happy anyways. And, um, that was a, a real epiphany for me is that I just don't belong in this kind of a lifestyle. Um, I, I, I resisted that anyways. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want the big house on the golf course. I, you know, was at, probably at that time had about four or five kids. My wife and I were more interested in, in raising our family and, um, we didn't really care what the Joneses thought. You know, we, we just wanted to keep, just keeping up with raising our kids was enough for us. John didn't want to be like these people he saw who were stuck in their corporate lifestyle. In the corporate world, you know, you're in a cubicle somewhere or you're, you know, a junior sales guy or a junior business development person. You look up through the hierarchy there, from cubicle worker up to the CEO in the company. And really the, the outward appearance is it's, it's really mostly about consumption. The, the, the CEO makes a lot more money. He has a bigger house. He... Uh, you know, goes on nicer vacations. And so people, when they look at that, they, and I'm saying this from experience, just from the people I talked to and the, and the lifestyles people led, whenever they got their next promotion, it was never because they really wanted to do the job. And they take these jobs and things, not because they enjoy them or because they want them. It's just because they want to get to the next level. And so they're always trying to get to that next level. The reason it never builds wealth is because, you know, they start out as some say, you know, a salesman for a company and they start out in Omaha, Nebraska and they do a really good job and they, they get promoted and they send them to Minneapolis. And when they move to Minneapolis, they buy a bigger house, they get a, a nicer car and they, you know, grind it out. They do their job. They do that for three or four years. They do a really good job. They get promoted. They send them to Chicago. They get to Chicago, they buy a bigger house, a bigger car, you know, put their kids in a better private school. And it's just, every time they get promoted, 
they they increase their lifestyle beyond what the the compensation is for that next job and so they find themselves as you know executives in companies in many cases making large sums of money but they're still really broke living paycheck to paycheck because they they never learned to stop consuming What John is describing is Rat Race 101. And just when you thought it could get no worse, at the end of the race, they don't get the big cheese like they were hoping for. There's only one CEO. And so you have all these hundreds of thousands of people working to get up that pyramid, and only a very small percentage of them are going to get that high. So along the way, you know, generally when you are in your late 40s, early 50s, peak earning years, you're costing your company a lot of money. They, they look for reasons to, to make people redundant. And um, so a lot of people end their careers early that way. It, it either get laid off, fired, or they get, you know, just side railed into some, some mid, mid-level management job that, that uh, you know, they're back in that cubicle that they hate. They have no control over anything. They have all these bills that they've accumulated. They're stuck in the matrix. They can't get out. This episode is not meant to make you feel bad about yourself. If you're in this situation, if you feel like you're stuck in a corporate rat race, don't worry. John was there too. He was looking around and seeing all this going on to his fellow employees. He could see the writing on the wall. So how did John break out of the matrix? He read a book that kind of opened his eyes. I read um, Dr. Thomas Stanley's book, The Millionaire Next Door was my epiphany because it isn't a book about how to make money. It's a book about how people that have money got it. You know, the millionaire next door, the guy that's, that's likely to have real wealth is someone that uh, more than likely started a small business or, you know, if they are a professional, uh, there's someone like a doctor or lawyer that, that has their own practice and they didn't go the corporate route. They, you know, they live in the same home that they've lived in for 20 some years. They're, you know, married to the same spouse. Uh, they live a conservative lifestyle in terms of they're they're not flashy, they're not glamorous, but they, by the time they're, you know, in their late 40s, early 50s, they have a million or more dollars and they're financially independent. They don't go to work every day because they have to. They go to work every day because they want to and because they enjoy it. John now had a goal. He wanted to be that millionaire next door, working for himself in control of his life. But remember, he has a family to feed, so he couldn't just quit his corporate job. But now he starts to formulate his exit strategy, the same one you can use if you're stuck in the rat race. And it begins with the next lesson. Saving money is just as important as making it. Four or five kids at the time, we went on to have six kids, so our our expenses are growing. But I learned to go out and make that corporate money, you know, don't quit my day job, get better at what I did, keep getting the bonuses and the promotions and things. I wasn't lulled into that, you know, sense of security that I was always going to have my job and that I wanted to keep up with the Joneses and I wanted to get the next bigger house on a better fairway on the golf course. When I was 35, I realized that that wasn't the life for me, but I just couldn't unplug. I just couldn't quit at that point. When I got that promotion or that bonus, I didn't go out and buy a boat. I put that money back into pay down the debt in my mortgage because I wanted to build my net worth there. And then I saved my money. I put as much as I could into things like um, IRAs and, and Roth IRAs and then my general trading account. And the last place he put money was into his new business, which brings us to lesson five. Don't quit your day job. Instead, use it to fund your side hustle. See, I didn't start my official business until I was like 50. So I, I was in corporate America 20 years before I ever got to that point. I had all those years in the military, but it was when I was at 35 years old, I had that epiphany. And I think what the reason this is important to your listeners is, is that you can start making a change now. Okay, you don't, even though it took me another you know 10 or 15 years to start my business, I was working on it when I was 35. And you, when you have that kind of goal in mind, you know, people say, well, how did you last all those years if you didn't like what you did? Well, you know, I had a family to support. 
So I kept my day job. I kept getting better at my day job. I kept doing all the things I needed to do to maintain my job. You know, I, I kept up with certifications and, and did all the things that my company wanted me to do. But at the same time, I developed my my hobby. I turned it into what eventually became my career. For me, that was trading stocks. Um, you know, kind of when we started this interview, I, I mentioned I, 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 I'm a money manager now. I have my own investment firm, but I didn't start out that way. I was, you know, 35 years old and I began to perfect trading stocks. And again, I did that because that's what I enjoyed. That's I had started always was always as a kid interested in trading stocks. And I, I can remember even talking to my grandparents about that. And they had no clue. You know, they didn't own a stock. They didn't know anything about it. But I had started trading stocks when I was in college and just bits and pieces trying to learn about it. I did that for about, you know, 10 years, seven to 10 years before I had that epiphany of, hey, focus on this, turn this hobby into your part time job. And then I did that to where I was, you know, successful enough in, you know, 12 years later, I, you know, I went from that $70,000 net worth to over a million dollar net worth. And it was, but it was because I didn't get pulled into that matrix. I, you know, I took my money and I invested it in what I was good at. That is the most important part. Right now you have a job. Where are you putting that money? If you're saving it and then using those savings to invest in a future business of your own, John's telling you that that's a good way to manage money. If you're taking the money that you're earning and using it to get a bigger house on a better golf course, so to speak, if you live that kind of lifestyle, you'll never get to enjoy a life where you really have the freedom to do what you want. Don't get caught in the matrix. Instead, invest in your own side business. So what should that business be? Should it be like John's business? Should you be a money manager for other people? Get really good at trading stocks? Well, no, that's not the point. And that brings us to John's sixth lesson about building wealth. You know, again, my message to other people is for you, it's not going to be stocks. It may be real estate. It may be building your homestead or your farm, or it may be someone that wants to be a carpenter or someone that's wants to program or write code. It doesn't matter what it is. It, it's finding what you're good at and what you'd like to do and creating that product or service that, that makes it marketable. It's about monetizing what you enjoy doing. So that's the sixth lesson John shares with us. When you're looking to start your own business, start with something that you're good at, something that you love to do and build from there. For me, well, I started with homesteading. What you talked about here, John, developing your hobby into a career. We often talk about how good, you know, homesteading, that's what our show's all about. It's such a good thing. It's so easy to turn that into a business um, or even parallel things like you talked about carpentry, you know, skills that the kind of homestead minded person might have that they love doing that they could turn into a career. Um, it's so easy to start as a side business. My very first business was selling pork as a pork farm, a pig farm. And it was as small as selling, it started off with four pigs. I just started selling pork to people I knew. Then I built the website. Then I started marketing. Then that turned into, hey, I'm, I'm actually got a knack for this online marketing thing. Let me try to sell that as a business. That's now my, I'm now completely self-employed doing online marketing for people filming and building websites and that sort of thing. And then out of that came this show home steady, the podcast and this online business of mine. And Austin too, uh, I'll also show. mention, you know, what you just said about, you know, you start out with, with one pig and then you get another one and you sell that and you do your online marketing and then you're doing a podcast and you down the road, the next couple of years, you want this podcast to be your main source of income. You know, it may not even work out that way, but it doesn't matter because had you never started with the pig or had you never done the online marketing or had you never done the podcast you know you would have never done those other incremental things that followed and so um, you know the important thing to me is that we just try these things and we do them and then that's when the opportunities come about you know that's right now so you're true. right now you're building your podcast that may lead to another opportunity that you never even dreamed about and you'll be like why do I want to do a podcast I want to do this you know and, <laughs> but you would have you would have never had that next opportunity had you not gone after the podcast. Yeah. And that's and what, that's what, 
it was we as we get into we talk about this apprenticeship and business model a lot of times it doesn't matter where you start the important thing is you need to start because yes. the opportunities uh, you know if you're home playing video games the opportunities <laughs> aren't going to find you you have to get out there and make them happen so the sixth lesson that john shares with us is this you can't get to where you want to be sitting home playing video games binging on netflix you got to take your extra time and your extra money and put it towards starting your own side business and start with something that you're interested in something that you love because you'll want to keep going when times get tough if you enjoy it you won't want to stop and like john says Maybe that won't be your final business. I started selling pigs, but that's not how I'm paying my bills now. But the fact is this, if I didn't start selling a couple pigs on the side, I would not be where I am today, completely self-employed and in control of my life, able to spend the time I want with my family on my homestead, doing what I love. If that's what you want, find something you're interested in and start that side business. I wanna thank John personally for taking the time to share these life lessons that he's learned with us and our audience here. John and I went on to talk for another hour and a half There's so much information that he shared that I just can't fit into this podcast. But the seventh lesson, the last lesson, is an excerpt from the rest of that conversation. Here John explains how to take a hobby and over time turn it into a business. Go out and start to study that particular thing that you're interested in. You know, again, making soap, um, carving things, who knows whatever it is, baking pies. Learn how to do it because it's all about a product and a service. Nothing, there's no wealth created unless there's a product or a service created. And so find out what that product or service is that you're going to create and then start on a small scale. If it's baking a pie, learn how to go out and bake a pie. Give it away. Give it to your kids. Give it to your spouse. See if they like it. Perfect it. Tweak it. When it gets really good, give it to your neighbors, right? You keep, you just keep expanding that, giving away free samples, letting people know that you're the expert in pie making. Um, you know how to make the best crust, or you have a unique recipe that, that makes it extra fluffy, or your apple pie is, you know, sweet but it still has this little bitterness, bitterness to it. You know, whatever it is, focus on those things and and learn how to broaden it and keep making it better. You just keep iterating it. At some point, you're, you're going to start selling that. But when you're first starting out, that's why it's sort of like it starts out as a hobby because you're not necessarily good enough to earn an income off of it. You shouldn't think that you're going to go out and get rich overnight, that people are going to start buying your pies. Learn how to make them. Start as a hobby, as an apprenticeship. Develop that skill. And those opportunities will come to you. The opportunities will come. If you start on that business, growing that hobby, learning more to the point where you take it to market, that's where the opportunities show up. This process John describes as a three-step process, apprenticeship, business model, and then finally investment. And we went on to discuss this for another hour together. It's just too much information to fit into this episode. So I have a bonus episode of this podcast in the Pioneer Library, where me and John discuss at length this three-step process, apprenticeship, business model, and investment. If you're interested in learning more about this, you can find that entire podcast in the Pioneer Library. Go to thisishomesteady.com and become a Pioneer. It's five bucks a month. You get all our bonus podcasts and some really in-depth video courses, which we're adding to the library every month. You can also learn a lot more about this process and building wealth in general from John's own podcast. He calls it the Wealth Steading Podcast. I asked him what Wealth Steading meant. Wealth Steading is one word. I, I obviously took it off of the concept of homesteading. What I saw my 
Italian immigrant grandfather basically had built a homestead all those years. So when he was in his 90s, he had a small railroad pension, but he lived a really good, nice lifestyle because he had all this, you know, organic food that he grew, all these things that he did to homestead. And so I looked at us in the 21st century, and I know a lot of people aren't probably going to you know, go farm three acres, but they can use their wealth to um, to build that same, the, the concept of building that same lifestyle off of is where you're taking your assets and you're letting your assets work for you instead of having to, to go work in corporate America. So it, it's a concept that I think that everybody can eventually get to. Yeah, if they check out the Wealth Steading podcast, I'd encourage them to listen to the first, se- uh, if they listen to the first 10 episodes, and this is something I recorded uh, it's about two years ago now. So uh, frankly, what happened was it was a 4th of July weekend in 2014, I think. I, I was really upset about something I'd heard, I don't know, Susie Orman or some stupid person on TV <laughs> say something that just drove me crazy. And I, and I said, you know, if I could just tell people the 10 things that got me where I'm at today, how, what would I tell them? And I sat down and I wrote those 10 um, wealth building principles out. And that's where I started with my podcast, and I don't know, we're 180 some episodes into it now. But if they start with those first 10, they'll at least get the foundation of where I'm coming from, how I built my wealth, how I'm probably no different than them. I'm not a genius, you know, I don't have an above average IQ. I wasn't born rich, I didn't get an MBA, and yet I'm managing over $16 million uh, of assets that. Um, is a business I you know I didn't start until a few years ago. So if I can do this, then everybody else can do it too. Now I know what you're probably thinking. This all sounds really good, but John, he's obviously a really smart man, and. Is this something that you could actually do? Could you follow these steps and actually find yourself where you want to be on your homestead working for yourself? Well, in our next story, we interview someone who's done this, following the same basic steps. He's made all his farm dreams happen, and he's done it by becoming a gopher exterminator. Sarah Connor? Yes. Get it? Exterminator? I couldn't help myself. Uh, well, I'm Matt Breckwald, live in Cuna, Idaho, and I'm the creator and the host of the podcast Off Farm Income. And uh, father of one, daughter Hattie, and uh, my wife Autumn, we all have our farm here in Cuna where we raise cattle and pigs and goats and hay. And hay indeed. Matt and his wife are living their farm dream right now, but it took them a while to get there, and it was a lot of hard work. From a young age, Matt knew that he wanted to work with animals. I kind of got involved in raising and working cattle when I was about 16, really, really enjoyed it. And so uh, when I went off to college, I majored in animal science and started working on different ranches and just trying to work with cattle as much as I could. By the time he left college, he knew one thing. And so when I finished, one of my goals was to have my own farm, but I didn't have one that I was going to inherit, didn't want have one I was going to go back to or anything like that. So started going about trying to figure out how that was going to eventually happen. Maybe you're in the same place right now. You want to have a farm, but you're not sure how you're going to be able to do it. Matt and Autumn both wanted to farm, but the road to the farm took a little bit longer than they hoped. Uh, I married Autumn, we got married, and that was one of our common goals. And life kind of happened. I, I was working down in California, actually, as a police officer for a few years. And then uh, her dad bought a ranch up here in Rupert, Idaho, and offered me the job as herdsman. Matt took the job. But sadly, this was not the path to the farm that they hoped for. It uh, didn't go the way he expected. So he sold the ranch and we kind of threw our hands up. I'd worked on a number of ranches and it's just like, I don't want to work for somebody else on their ranch again. So after trying a few other things, Matt winds up back as a police officer. So I wound up going back into law enforcement here in Boise, Idaho. And we ended up living in the city for about the next 10 years. And during that time, 
Uh, we bought a house, bought a rental house, started living the city life. It's something I talk about on the podcast all the time. I was buying all the toys, you know, trailers, four wheelers. I was a weekend warrior. So working for the weekend and then escaping every weekend to somewhere to go be around nature, you know, camping or out to the desert or whatever it may be. Was there an emptiness that you were trying to fill with all these toys and all this recreation? Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I talk about that a lot on my show as well, but for somebody like myself, I was, I call it self-medicating. I was totally self-medicating with vacations, with toys, uh, with different material purchases. And all of those things are temporary, right? It makes you feel better for a little while, but I was absolutely self-medicating. And the reason why I was doing that was because I was in the wrong fit. Uh, police work was no longer the correct fit for me. And so I was doing something to try and make my weekends as good as possible because on Sunday night, if I, you know, police officers don't have a traditional schedule, but theoretically on Sunday night, I would get the Sunday night blues because I had to go back to work the next day and I was dreading it. And so I would try and make those weekends or those vacations as good as possible uh, to drown out the rest of the time where I wasn't in the right fit. So I wasn't happy. These are the signs that you should look for to tell you that you're not really doing what you really want to be doing. Self-medicating with toys, being a weekend warrior, the Sunday night blues. If this sounds familiar, maybe it's time to start planning an exit strategy. Well, for the first five years of Hattie's life, I was a detective and I investigated child abuse and domestic violence. So day after day after day after day, it was just nothing but the worst of what was going on uh, in the city of Boise. You're dealing with uh, people in crisis, people in the worst moments of their life, and your worldview starts to get shaped a little bit by that. Matt had to deal with some really stressful situations, but not every day spent in his law enforcement career was that serious. What was the most, can you remember like the most ridiculous call that you ever had to respond to? The last Christmas Eve I worked and uh, I got a call from a guy. He was extremely intoxicated. He lived in the city of Boise, but he had horses. So you know what's going on here. This guy's drunk. He doesn't want to drive, but he also doesn't want to pay for an Uber. And he wanted to know if he could legally ride his horse to work through the city. (laughs) <laughs> and this is this is Christmas Eve. There's nothing going on. This guy's drunk. And uh, so I actually researched it for him because I figured, well, of course you can. But the, <laughs> after I researched it, I found out, no, he couldn't. There was city ordinances preventing it. And there was no legal way for him to ride his horse from his house to his workplace. So uh, I had to deliver the bad news on Christmas Eve that he could not commute on his horse. <laughs> If he had been riding while intoxicated, could he get an RUI? I think it's an I think it's an EUI, <laughs> e- equine under the influence, but I'm not I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, you know, honestly, I didn't leave police work because because anything in particular happened or because I couldn't handle the work anymore. I left because I got really honest with myself. And and what happened over time for me was when something significant happened at the police department, I still loved the job. I still really enjoyed it. And when I say something significant, I'm talking about like a homicide investigation. I'm talking about like a pursuit or uh, a use of force or a robbery investigation or something like that. I mean, that type of stuff is very, very intrinsically rewarding and and really, really enjoyable to deal with, Uh, I guess, if you're wired that way. So it, it wasn't anything in particular that drove me out. What drove me out was that I had been doing it for 15 years and you just change over time. I got really excited about it when I was 21, 22, getting ready to graduate college, went through the police academy and really wanted to be a police officer and got out there and started doing it and just thought it was the greatest thing in the world. But after about 15 years, a lot of that everyday excitement wore off and it turned into a job, which is fine. But Not everybody gets into a job that is the perfect fit for them. And so after 15 years, I just found me to be a different person than I was at age 22 or 23. 
I had different goals, different things that sparked my interest, different things that challenged me. And quite honestly, I left there in 2013 from about 2009 through the time I gave my notice in 2013. All I did was read about or consume podcasts and audiobooks about entrepreneurship. And I was just very, very eager to go out and try something on my own. And I just had a, I just had a new season in life come around. And so pretty soon I had all these ideas and all this motivation and all these things I wanted to try and do and see if I could make it on my own and challenge myself in that way. And when I had to sit and watch the clock and wait for my shift to end as a police sergeant there at the end when I promoted, it just, it didn't drive me. I felt like my work quality at, at at the police job was going down and I, I don't like to uh, give less than my best, but I felt like I was a little bit burned out and I wasn't uh, giving my best anymore. And then of course in police work, there's a double negative because if you're not giving your best, you might not be paying attention as well as you should. And that becomes a safety issue. And I certainly didn't want to get hurt because I was uh, keeping myself in a job that was no longer the correct fit for me. So really that's why I left. Not only did he leave his occupation as a police officer, but Matt and his wife realized they needed to leave the city because of their daughter. That was going on, and then we had our daughter Hattie in 2006. And and one of our pledges is we wanted to raise our kids in the way we'd been raised, because I grew up extremely rural, and then get involved working with cattle about age 16. And then Autumn, of course, grew up on the farm. And uh, we wanted to raise her that way, and we were nowhere closer to it uh, than we'd been before. And so we got back out looking at land again and then just got pretty lucky with uh, finding this place when it dropped down into our price range. I want to take this point to just do a quick review here. Matt followed a lot of the same basic principles that John Buglano talked about in our interview. At first, he really loved his career in police work. But over time, that love faded. And instead of making the change sooner, Matt tried to medicate. Vacations with toys, uh, with different material purchases. In much the same way that John says he observed people medicating in corporate America. The, the big sports car and the boat, and they had all these things that they were just trying to keep up with the Joneses, and yet they weren't happy anyways. And all of those things are temporary, right? It makes you feel better for a little while. They weren't happy because they weren't doing what they really wanted to be doing. And all the toys in the world won't really make a kid happy right? Fortunately, Matt realized this. Instead of just sticking it out and pushing himself through so he could get all the promotions, live in that kind of more safe life, Matt realized he needed a change. Like we learned in lesson two, Matt knew that wealth wasn't just the amount of money he was earning from his career, but rather it was the freedom to do what he wanted, to be with his family where he wanted, raising his daughter how they planned. And Lesson three, Matt didn't believe the brainwashing. Despite the fact that he kept getting promotions at work and climbing that ladder, he realized that was never going to make him feel happy. It wasn't making him feel fulfilled. His life had changed, and so he was no longer going to stick with the plan. But much like John advised us in lesson five, he didn't quit his day job immediately. So I kept my day job. I kept doing all the things I needed to do. But at the same time, I developed my, my hobby. I turned it into what eventually became my career. From about 2009 through the time I gave my notice in 2013, all I did was read about or consume podcasts and audiobooks about entrepreneurship. He used that time to his advantage. He stayed at his job, continued getting that good paycheck, all the meanwhile, he was learning and preparing for the next stage, starting his own business. Which brings us to the story about how Matt became a gopher exterminator. I'm a friend of Sarah Connor. I was told that she's here. Could I see her, please? No, can't see her. She's making a statement. Where is she? Look, it may take a while. I want to wait. There's a bench over there. <laughs> comes I'll be back <laughs> I couldn't help myself is when I first started really getting interested in being an entrepreneur 
I got hooked on this notion that you had to find your passion. And I don't know if this was me misunderstanding what I was reading and hearing or if, uh, if it was just led down the wrong path, but I got convinced that I could not be successful as an entrepreneur unless I identified what my passion was and then pursued my passion. So I spent like two years banging my head against the wall, maybe three years banging my head against the wall, trying to figure out what in the world my passion was. So I would just have this unbelievably untapped resource of energy that would drive me to work 18 hour days for the next three years to develop this business because it was my passion. And after two or three years, I couldn't figure out what my passion was. And I was getting depressed. Like I'm never going to be able to be an entrepreneur, never going to be able to work for myself because I can't identify my passion. And so then I kind of went to plan B uh, is the way I put it. And plan B was, okay, can't find my passion. So let's start a business and find something that you can go out and work for yourself. You know, you want to work for yourself. So let's just make that happen and see, you know, where it goes. And there was a guy in the paper who was advertising this machine that he had developed just for exterminating gophers. And this really interested me because... Because of something that happened while Matt was investigating a stalking case. When I had been a police detective, I was investigating a stalking case where this guy uh, was accused of stalking his ex-girlfriend. And so I was doing surveillance on his house one day. And so I'm sitting down the road in my unmarked car, watching his house to see if I can follow him and to see if he is stalking. So Matt's outside the stalker's house. He's stalking the stalker to see if the stalker is in fact stalking his girlfriend. Huh? Only difference is Matt is stalking in the name of the law. So while I'm waiting for him to leave, this guy across the street pulls up and he's pulling this really odd trailer. See, Matt's not actually a stalker, so naturally he was distracted by this man pulling up across the street with this strange contraption. And he stops and he unhooks the trailer from his vehicle and puts all the jacks down, opens up all these flaps, and some weird antenna goes way up and a computer comes out of it. And it's this really odd looking contraption. And he gets it all set up and then he goes up to the house I'm sitting in front of, knocks on the door. The owner of the house comes out. He shows him this trailer. Obviously, he's explaining to him how everything works. Uh, they shake hands. Everybody's happy. The guy pays him. He gives him an invoice. Um, they put the trailer, they kind of break it back down to its original form. He drives away, and the new owner takes the trailer. And I was sitting there at this stakeout going. And that's where Matt has his aha moment. That's what I need to find is a piece of equipment like that that I can take out to different job sites and I can work for people. He realizes he doesn't need some passion project. To be self-employed, he just needs a machine like this where he can just show up, turn on the machine, and charge people for it. A few years later, looking through a magazine, Matt finds an ad for a machine kind of like that. And I see this ad for this machine that you can take out to farmers' places and exterminate gophers for them. I was like, that is what I've been thinking about. And so I got really interested in that, and I talked myself right out of it. But not for very long. Matt and his wife attend a farming class a couple months later. And guess what comes up? And on the first night, the instructor asked what everybody's number one headache on their small piece of acreage was. And everybody in there said gophers, which are a big deal out here in the West, pocket gophers. And I am kicking autumn under the table and going, did you hear that? Did you hear that? That's it. We got to start the business. And I was like, that's it. Everybody needs it. This is going to be a great business. I'll be back. And I just kept chickening out. And then about uh, four weeks into the class, they actually had a gopher trapper come in and talk to everybody about gophers and what to do. And that night after that class, I was like, we have got to buy this machine and start this business. And then I talked myself out of it again. This is a real pattern that develops. Matt thinking he wants to do this, then he chickens out. Then thinking he wants to do it, and then chickens out. Until one night. About three in the morning, I just woke up, eyes wide open, totally wide awake, and I realized that I didn't like my job, 
and I wanted to start my own business. And if I didn't buy a gopher machine right now, I was going to miss the entire 2012 season. And I was going to have to wait all the way until a year from now to start my own business. So I'll be honest, I've had a lot of deep thoughts wake me up in the middle of the night, but never have they revolved around gophers. My first customer was a lady out in this town called Marsing, and she could have paid me five bucks or she could have paid me 500. It would not have made any difference uh, just to go out and provide a service for somebody and have them pay you cash for it. I just was ecstatic. I couldn't believe the feeling. And I got hooked right then and there. Now, Matt hadn't found his passion in gopher extermination, but what he had found was a chance to break free from the rat race, to work in the country, and most importantly, a way to support his farm dream without having to work in the city. Fueled by the excitement of this feeling of being an entrepreneur, being in charge, his business grew quickly. He poured himself into some guerrilla marketing. I wrote articles for publications about gophers. I did videos. Uh, I put free resources up on my website. I did blog posts. And trust me, trying to figure out something to write about gophers is not easy. It's called a perk which stands for Pressurized Exhaust Rodent Control. It, uh, it's got a 14 horsepower motor on it, and the motor powers an air compressor, but instead of compressing air, all of the exhaust from the engine goes into the air compressor and gets compressed, which is all the carbon monoxide. And then you inject the carbon monoxide into the, uh, the tunnels of the burrowing rodent, you know, gophers, ground squirrels. People use them on prairie dogs, voles things like that, you inject it uh, into there at a really, really high pressure, and uh, it does a very, very good job of exterminating them. Now, I know what you're thinking. Okay, well, let's be honest. Some of you are thinking, oh, poor gophers, right? But gophers are a serious problem for big-scale farmers. I found one estimate that said that one gopher in a hayfield costs the value of two bales per year, not to mention damage done to the equipment. Another figure mentioned that in the United States, gophers cost farmers millions. Now, I didn't see the data to back that up, but somewhere between the cost of a couple bales of hay and millions of dollars is our answer. And the answer is that yes, the gophers are a problem. And so Matt saw this need, this problem, <laughs> and he had a solution <laughs> that he could bring to market, which then would free him from being in a job that was no longer making him happy and would support his farm and homesteading life. So win, 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 win for Matt, win for Matt's farm, win for the farmers, not so much a win for the gopher. Now it may seem like Matt has strayed from some of the lessons that we learned from John, but in actuality, he pretty much has stayed on track. Although gopher killing is not his passion, his passion for farming and living in the country and his passion for entrepreneurship led him to this place where he found a service he could provide to the people who he wanted to work with where and when he wanted to work. So following the passion, lesson number six checks out with Matt. John even told me that following your passion when starting a business, it may lead to other things you never even imagined. Right now you're building your podcast. That may lead to another opportunity that you never even dreamed about. You would have never had that next opportunity had you not gone after the podcast. And that's exactly what happened to Matt, the gopher terminator. If Matt hadn't been interested in entrepreneurship, he wouldn't have been paying attention to that gopher machine ad. And if him and his wife hadn't been pursuing their passion of farming, they never would have been at that class. The fact that they wanted to farm led them to the class, which helped them see the need of their local community that they could fill to start a business that now could help them farm. 
And lesson number seven, continuing to learn to be an apprentice in your field for a long time, mastering your craft. Well, no, Matt did not spend a lot of time mastering the craft of extermination before he brought it to market. Fortunately for Matt, he found a service he could provide without years and years of having to apprentice for it. That said, he did spend a lot of time learning about being an entrepreneur. So Matt really did follow most of the basic principles that John showed us today. Matt and Autumn always wanted to farm, but they knew, having spent years of their life working for other farmers, that the property they had and the methods they were going to use it for were not going to be able to pay all their bills. But they didn't let that stop them from their farm dreams. Instead, they looked to starting this business to help them get there. The farm is profitable and the farm makes good money, um, but there's a maximum production capability on this farm. And so even at maximum production capability on this farm, it's not enough household income to support the household. So I knew I needed something in addition to the farm. But yes, the goal has always been so I could farm. Maybe you're listening to that and thinking, he's just not doing it right. He's just not farming right. He could do better. He could make it work with 25 acres. Well, Matt's not alone. In fact, he shared a statistic with me that was really surprising. Currently in the United States, 91, I think it's 91% of all farmers, uh, hobbyists or production agriculture, bring in income that doesn't come from the farm as part of their household How income. many was that? And they have to. 91%. Wow. Crazy. And, and these... Yeah, these statistics are all verifiable, and this is um, this is including large production agriculture, where they're they're bringing in income from off the farm uh, to help with the household. So a lot of times that's with a spouse working or something like that, but they are bringing in some income from off the farm one way or another. So the 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 ability to farm and just farm does exist, and I'm super jealous of those guys. Uh, but I don't want to borrow the money to be one of them. And uh, the the obstacles to entry in agriculture today are huge. They just are. And that's, that's a problem we're facing nationwide when it comes to agriculture is that the obstacles to entry are high. Uh, the potential income doesn't compete well with other jobs or careers that are out there. And so you have more risk, more capital outlay for less potential income. So you've got to love the lifestyle. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. I think that's an understatement. You have to more than just love the lifestyle. The barriers of entry are so high and the profit margin so tight. I don't think you have to just love the lifestyle. Someone who's a brand new farmer wanting to get into it and just farm full time, you literally have to sacrifice a major part of your life for it. Because you have to say to yourself, look, I'm smart enough to make this work and I'll work hard enough to make this work. I'll be dedicated enough. I will devote myself to all this. And if you put all that into it, you're gonna make way less money than you could if you applied yourself in some other career. And I'm gonna be flat out honest. At one point in time, I thought that was me, but I now know that's not me. And that's probably not a lot of farmers seeing that nine out of 10 are looking to other sources of income to pay the bills. They're farming for a lifestyle and for the love of it, but they're not farming for a living. So we're coming to the end here. What does it all mean for you? Well, you could take three approaches. The first one, what? Nine out of 10 farmers don't make enough money to provide for their families? Forget it, I'm never gonna farm. Or you could try this approach. You could say, Matt, Austin, all these nine out of 10 farmers who were not living off their farm income, they're all idiots. I know better, 
I'll do better, I'll be better, and I'll make it work. And maybe you will. Maybe you'll be that one out of 10 farmers who starts your homestead business, starts your farm business, and makes a great income off of it, and just farms for a living. And if you do it, awesome. Call me up and we'll interview you and we'll have you tell us exactly how you do it. And I'm not being sarcastic. There are those people out there. And then of course, there's the third option. You could say, you know what? Guys like Austin, guys like Matt, like a lot of the people we've interviewed on this show, they're smart. They are able to build businesses that work parallel to their farm and homestead dreams. They give them more freedom and more ability to enjoy the actual time on their homestead. If you feel yourself leaning towards that approach, well then I invite you to ask yourself this question. What is going to be my off-farm income? If you're not sure what to do yet, I have a great resource for you. Search for the Off Farm Income Podcast over in iTunes. That's Matt's podcast, which is designed to help you figure out how to support your farming habit with a good source of income. An income that you would be making off farm. Um, Any last parting word, advice, you know, things that you could offer to encourage our listeners to make the, to start, make the first step? Well, I think you can do, no matter what your situation is right now, you can begin, you can start, just start, just get off your butt and start. And you can start right now, uh, just like I did in 2009, by just starting to consume as much material as you can. Even if you're going, if I read a book, right now and I can't farm for six years, I'm never going to remember what I read. It plants a seed. And once you get enough seeds planted, things start to sprout up and you start to formulate a picture that you just can't imagine until you begin. You ready to get some seeds planted? If you're the person who's sitting there right now saying, I would love to have my own business, but I just have no spare money to put towards it and I have a full-time job eating up my schedule, well, here is your game plan. Stop watching Netflix, turn off the video games, scrimp $1,000, and then head on over to thisishomesteady.com and click on this episode on this episode's blog write-up done by Alexia, the suburban escapee. There's a giant list in her write-up of a ton of different kinds of jobs that you could start as a side business while you already have a full-time job for less than $1,000. I hope these ideas inspire you and help you to start your own side business, even if it's not your passion, even if it's killing gophers. I'll be back. My sister sent me a video recently, and I think it's a perfect way to end today's episode. Because honestly, I can't say this any better to you than Shia LaBeouf already has in his one minute motivational speech. Just do it. Do it. Just do it. Don't let your dreams be dreams. Yesterday, you said tomorrow. So just do it. Make your dreams come true. Just do it. Some people dream of success while you're going to wake up and work hard at it. Nothing is impossible. You should get to the point where anyone else would quit, and you're not going to stop there. No, what are you waiting for? Do it! Just do it! Yes, you can! Just do it! If you're tired of starting over, stop giving up. If you take one step, then you will be a little closer to your dream.
Hello from Putnam Valley, New York. About eight months ago, my wife and I、Hello. moved up from Brooklyn, New York, in a one bedroom apartment with a very small backyard. And、uh, right now we have an 1830s farmhouse with 15 acres, got about a 600 square foot vegetable garden, 12 chickens, four turkeys, and thinking about two pigs in the spring. We also have two dogs and a baby on the way. Right now, I'm about to power pluck three chickens. I'm Jay, and I'm Kristen, and we are Homesteady. Special thanks in today's episode to both John Puglano of the Wealth Steading Podcast and Matt Breckenwald of the Off Farm Income Podcast. It was a pleasure to interview two fellow podcasters. And go and check out their shows. Their shows are great. They'll definitely help you get on the road to making these homestead dreams happen, make them realities, and make them start in the year 2017. Just do it. Of course, this episode is brought to you by the Homesteady Pioneers, like Jay and Kristen, who are doing a great job on their homestead. You can follow Jay over at his Instagram account, another J A Y. L E E, another J Lee.、Uh, there you'll see a perfect example of a couple who's homesteading and supporting their homestead and their new family by being entrepreneurs. And they had that baby. And if I didn't have my own six month old right now, I would say he was the cutest baby in the world. But sorry, guys, got my own. So can't go on record with that. So check out another J Lee on Instagram. Tell them you heard their shout out on the Homesteady show. If you'd like to connect on Instagram, use the hashtag I am Homesteady. I check all those posts and、uh, comment back and forth with you. Thanks for listening to the show, guys. If you'd like to support it, become a pioneer. It's five bucks a month. You will be hearing another episode of us very soon. We got to get a new update episode out because、uh, some of our big plans have changed. And let's just say the homesteading bug is biting us pretty hard this winter. And、uh, we got a lot planned for our homestead in the springtime. Our trip is going to be delayed a little bit. So、uh, we'll have an update show for you soon. Until then, remember the road is rocky. Make homesteady. <laughs>